Okay. Well, welcome back to Day Timers. We are uh, we are in Philippians. We're at the end of chapter three, verse seventeen is where we'll start today. And before we even read that, we of course will begin our study in prayer. Gracious God, we rejoice in you always, and again we say rejoice. And we thank you that you give us a community of believers to rejoice together because we can't all keep the torch lit on our own um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and our joys come and go personally, but together when we surround your word, you cause us to rejoice. And so help us this day to, uh, to, take, uh, to take joy in you and to take comfort in your promises. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, get myself situated here. All right. So we had a we we had a couple of wonderful sections last week. The whole section about Paul's background and his uh, life uh, under the law, and what he how he compares that to knowing Christ and his resurrection. Uh, then we had that wonderful image of pressing on toward the goal. Uh, how do you take hold of something for which you've already been taken hold of by Christ? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then uh, our first section here, um, maybe not as memorable, but it has a couple of really um, important topics that it raises. Um, uh, first, we have another nod toward his opponents. And then we can talk about citizenship in heaven and uh, that ongoing uh, struggle between uh, our earthly citizenship uh, and our heavenly. And then he's also going to talk about resurrection. And then from there, we'll get to chapter four today, and we'll talk about uh, uh, he has yet another kind of disunity in the church, and he's going to urge people to come to peace, and we'll talk about that. So, Philippians 3.17. Oh, let me first of all, real quick, set my, set my camera like that. Okay. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. So there's a lot going on in there too. We see, of course, Paul's deep affection, uh, even with tears as he thinks about the opponents um, and, and, and then his, uh, his dear church. You see themes we've been following all along, uh, uh, the mind, the mindset, uh, earthly things or heavenly things. Um, the, the mind that is of Christ, of course, is going to um, follow the shape of the cross in our life together. And his opponents here then, of course, are named as people who are enemies of the cross. And uh, so, so the first question today is really, what is it to live as enemies of the cross of Christ? Um, he, 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 and I'm asking you that as well. Um, at the very least, he seems to lay out a couple of things here. Um, he goes right on to talk about their God as the belly. Um, so you have this, uh, this distinction between um, Christ crucified giving of himself versus the God of the belly that takes in uh, for its own self. Um, so we can think about appetites. Uh, this is often the common quote unquote, um, adversary to the Christian life would be those, those desires, those appetites, um, those wants. Um, and then particularly those people who live, uh, as hedonists, uh, all for the pleasure of the moment, uh, without thought for either morality or even thought for tomorrow. Uh, always nice to consider them those people. Although if you, if you did tune in on Ash Wednesday, um, Dorian Gray, uh, uh, certainly went down that path, um, and his end was destruction. 
So that's, of course, one obvious uh, description of, a, of being an enemy of the cross of Christ. But then we also are just coming off of the heels of last week when Paul talks about a righteousness from faith and not from the law. And so there is another way to be an enemy of the cross of Christ, which is to say the cross of Christ is nice and all. It's nice that Jesus is so loving, but what was really necessary about that whole uh, sacrifice? Um, we can still be righteous under the law. Uh, we, we, can, we can still get our act together. And maybe we're inspired by the love of Jesus and the, the, the death of Jesus, but um, we can also then um, uh, use that to inspire us back into our life under the law. And Paul will say that that's also to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's to add something to Jesus. And of course, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, one of the, one of the things I picked up along the way in seminary was, uh, in preaching class, the question is, did Jesus need to be crucified in order for you to preach this particular sermon? Another way to ask that kind of question is, could you have preached that sermon in a synagogue or in a Mormon, uh, a Mormon church? And if, you, if the answer is yes, then, um, then you have to wonder how central the cross of Christ is in the, in the word. Let me pause there, um, just as I've introduced at the, uh, the enemies of the cross piece and given you at least a couple examples of how that could go. Well, let me just pause and, and hear what you're thinking on this. as you wish. <laughs> and if not, I'll move forward. <laughs> I have a really deep question. <laughs> Sounds like you're setting yourself up. <laughs> uh, well, that just, just to show the fear I have in asking it. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> um, when he mentions their enemies of the cross. Yeah. I hear in that uh, out there, that enemy, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned that, and that's mm -hmm. been experience. Well, my studies from my background show me, and I don't mean spiritual, I mean my professional background, yeah, yeah, which is psychology and that whole world. Usually, what we say to others comes from something somewhere within ourselves, mm -hmm. yeah, and. This isn't a question, maybe, but um, I can understand why Paul would have tears mm -hmm. as he points at his enemies because of the pain he would feel, not a, maybe even about himself, but for them. Yeah. I, I don't know. But anyway, that I had written that as I listened and I thought, oh my goodness, projection looks to be such a deception and it's i do not see projection in paul's words i see compassion so when he's sure. speaking of enemies i see it a little differently i just want to lay that there that that's part of what i'm hearing here well yeah and and he's preaching the christ who says love your enemies bless those who persecute you um and and it's um it, it takes, you know, nowadays we want to say you're either, well, if you're, if you're against me at all, if you love me, you've got to love all about me. And that's true. But there's also this compassion, which can say, I love you, but your, uh, your end is destruction on this particular path or this particular, you know, mm -hmm. curse that you bear, whether it's your own, you know, doing or not, um, uh, and, and yeah, and, it, and I think you're right in, in highlighting this because Paul has just talked about his former life in, in the law. But so he that's, knows. That's where I saw his tears coming from is it's tears mm -hmm. for them. I yes. Mean, okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And he's similar in Romans 9 and 9, 9, 10 and 11 when he says, I wish that I could be accursed for their sake. Right. Um, and I know this is, you know, this is clearly... Um, personal not only to you but to so many of us that um, when you come to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and you come to see how so much of your former mindset or or whatever it is uh, beliefs values to, to see it as rubbish compared to having been received by the grace of Christ 
you just want that for you want that for your children you want that for your brothers you want that for your friends uh, and for them to not have it doesn't mean they're not an enemy of the cross <laughs> uh, but it does mean i love I, I love this 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 person who um is an enemy of the cross there's another piece of this too which um it's not really where we maybe have room to go today but there is a sense in which when we preach the cross, it's making, it, it first makes all of us enemies of the cross. Um, we kind of have this, we have a cross piety or devotion. So we sing, um, I, I cling to the old rugged cross. We, we talk about um, um, the wondrous cross. I lift, uh, I'm trying to remember how that one goes, but the wondrous cross, we, we lift high the cross. Um, so the cross has become a symbol of Christ's victory in our lives. But initially, the preaching of the cross actually is the, it's the work of the law. It says this, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made Lord and, and Messiah. Um, and, uh, and, and so the first truth is that we are all enemies of the cross of Christ. But by the grace of God, Jesus has loved his enemies and has brought us um, you know, out the other side. But it's that very thought, Tom, that that allows us to love others, hmm. because it, no matter what they may be doing or saying at that moment in time, it it gives us it gives us His love, His grace that can flow through. Mm -hmm. That over maybe instantly or maybe over a long period of time touches reaches and then they too can live in the grace of the cross hmm. yeah we'll see this in a in a, a section or two paul talks about let your gentleness be evident to everyone and, and again it's you know how do you call someone an enemy of the cross of christ <laughs> but then also do that in a gentle manner but but there is a sense in which um you you see that in how christ endures the cross and and what he says from the cross and um and and again it's to be an enemy of the cross doesn't even have to mean sort of a specific rejection of jesus the crucified one although it, it certainly can mean that as well it can also simply mean um or it can additionally mean uh, a rejection of the way of life that involves suffering that involves confronting pain uh that involves dealing with your scapegoats which is to say stop scapegoating uh and look look truthfully at yourself um uh, and and another kinds of things you know it's that fearless uh moral inventory uh, of a of a 12-step group yeah and and and, and then again this is also part of what <clears throat> what makes lutheranism so countercultural in uh in our country in our context because it's not um it's not always a glorious <clears throat> higher and higher, um, stronger and stronger, um, but it involves, it involves hardship. It involves finding Jesus um, uh, on the cross and not always in the ever-growing church or the ever-growing spiritual life. Um, this is what Luther gets at in his, I, I've been, uh, last Sunday I quoted a couple of his theses from Heidelberg. Um, and uh, here's a different one, thesis 21, not that you want to keep score, but uh, he says, a theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theology of the cross calls a thing what it is. And he goes on to, um, in his, again, yeah, a theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theology of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. <clears throat> Um, and here's, here's just a, a piece from his, um, his proof of that thesis, and that might help to explain what, he's, what he means. He also quotes uh, Philippians 3.18 in it, which is where I pulled it from. Uh, he says, he who does not know Christ does not know God hidden in suffering. Therefore, that one prefers works to suffering, prefers glory to the cross, strength to weakness, wisdom to folly, and in general, good to evil. These are the people whom the apostle calls enemies of the cross of Christ. For they hate the cross and suffering, 
and love works and the glory of works. Thus they call the good of the cross evil and the evil of a deed good. God can only be found in suffering and the cross. Therefore, the friends of the cross say that the cross is good and works are evil. For through the cross, works are dethroned. And the old Adam, who is especially edified by works, is crucified. It is impossible for a person not to be puffed up by his good works unless he has first been deflated and destroyed by suffering and evil until he knows that his works are not his, but God's. Okay, let's, let's press forward. Um, Uh, Tom, that see yes. Luther just just blows all of our culture out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, I saw you put I saw you put Chad Bird's book out on display. Yeah, your God is too glorious. Finding God in the most unexpected places. Um, and uh, this is a one. This I, I I'm hoping one of these times our book club will choose a Chad Bird book. Um, uh, I know, although I know I could just insist, but. Um, He's very good at that very thing um, is just you can love your country, but also know that um, half of half of Americans questions about pain and suffering is a surprise that it's even happening. You know, the, the shock that we're suffering is half of our theological trouble with God in the midst of hard things um, where no one else in in history has been surprised. <laughs> What's the title again? Your, uh, your God is too glorious. God is too glorious. Yeah. Nobody's read it yet. It's right there. <laughs> I know. Well, well, maybe we'll get the book club on it soon. I actually think it would be a good um, one to read uh, after Richard Rohr. Um, I think it'd be an interesting, uh, interesting follow-up. But anyway, okay, back to Philippians. The next uh, couple lines, uh, verse twenty and, and forward, talks about citizenship in heaven. And uh, and this is a big thing. We we've we've kind of foreshadowed it over the weeks that of course Philippi itself was a Roman colony because nobody wants thousands of victorious soldiers to move back to Rome and get crazy ideas. And so you give them land and colonize uh, the world that you've uh, conquered. So Philippi is very Roman and, uh, and Paul has already mentioned citizenship um, in, in, in a couple of points. So now he, he outright says our citizenship is in heaven. And, uh, and here we find, you know, a couple of routes that interpretation can go. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, our first response is to say, because we're citiz our citizenship is in heaven, it is to there we are going. So the movement of the Christian life is away from earth uh, to heaven, elsewhere uh, to uh, go be citizens where we really are. But the verse, the, 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 the next thing Paul says is, it is from there. We expect a savior, the Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. So our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there we expect the Lord to return. And then it doesn't answer the question, "What then?" Um, and we then find elsewhere in Scripture that, of course, heaven and earth will be made new, renewed, uh, reunited with the image of a of a bride and a groom coming together in marriage at the end of Revelation. In any case, God's good creation is not to be abandoned nor left behind but is to be renewed. And so our citizenship in heaven means um, we belong to God, uh, but it doesn't mean we are, uh, uh, that salvation means to get away from earth and even less so to get away from creatureliness, uh, which includes the body. Um, but something has to be done about this old body uh, before, uh, before the new creation is, uh, is, uh, is fully and completely here. So our citizenship is in heaven. It's kind of like uh, the people living in Philippi. They know their citizenship is in Rome, but they don't expect to move to Rome. Uh, but they do expect that if the barbarians up north cause trouble uh, coming down to Philippi, that from Rome, uh, help will come and, uh, and restore them. And part of our, my difficulty is always that <laughs> we've been carefully taught that we're going somewhere. And no, no, we're going to someone, and yeah. that that uh, what that where is is unknown, 
but we know that we will be with someone who is Christ and it doesn't matter where the where is. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the, all, all of our questions about heaven are about the where and the who else is there. Yeah. The, yeah. Really the central piece is it's the Lord is there. <laughs> yeah. I have recently reframed the word heaven um, uh -huh. because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so yes. that's the question. And so here's my reframe. Heaven is where <laughs> there is joy, service, meaning, and connection. And so that's my where. That's the new where for me, that heaven is where there is joy, service, meaning, and connection. And so that's how I can see, if you will, the church or a family or a community can be, and hear this lightly, heaven. And I know there's always more than one time period when we're speaking of scriptural words, but that really helped me recently. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, those are examples of when the kingdom of God comes on earth as it is in heaven. This is what it looks like. Yeah. 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 And uh, John's gospel is good on eternal life. You know, eternal life is to know the one whom God sent. Um, yeah. Well, that was, you know, um, you know, my favorite C.S. Lewis book, The Great Divorce, in this vision of an afterlife. Um, in the introduction, you know, he, he's trying to be clear that he's not actually saying heaven or hell looks like this. Um, uh, and, and one of the, I forgot exactly how he said it, but it's basically from the perspective of eternity, looking back on our life right now, um, our life right now will look like the threshold of heaven the whole time or the, you know, first uh, fall into hell. So that, you know, heaven and hell are like you are suggesting, Mary, is heaven and Heaven or hell can be spiritual realities or, or, or a spiritual quality to what's going on right now. Um, and, well, my definition of hell might help. That's <laughs> isolation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hell is isolation. And have you read The Great Divorce? I'm sure you've. <laughs> I have not. Okay. If, read, read The Great Divorce. It's a short C.S. Lewis novel, but isolation is the very way he pictures hell. That's right. You'll, you'll be, you'll be really struck by it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that one of the problems we have is we go back to, um, let's see, 14. I mm -hmm. press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call. And I get, think that gives us this concept that heaven is up. Sure. Yeah. You know, the most, I think one of the best things about the great divorce is that there's a constant movement of trying to convince the people in hell to move to the threshold of heaven. And most of them refuse. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and so the kingdom of God in our place is what we have to build on because the kingdom of God that Christ dwells in is already here. Mm -hmm. and that, yeah. that what is in our place say that again judy in another way well the kingdom of god is here we right. live in it this is where he lives in us the kingdom has come and so where when our destination as as paul talks about is to be not just in christ but with christ yeah, in real time okay. i see yeah that was yeah i yeah. understood that that was not okay what i thought you were saying okay well and as as jerry points out the upward call of god um tricks tricks us uh theologians of glory um into saying well the upward call of god is going to make give me my best life now it's going to empower me for successful living uh, as my culture defines it um when instead the upward call is actually a call upward to a, a hill on which is a cross um, on which um, we fall upward <laughs> to quote our uh, other read. So, uh, and, and, you know, um, that's, that's a hard, that's a hard mm -hmm. ask. <laughs> so it's a citizenship in heaven. Um, uh, I don't want to take a ton of time on 
sort of the the two realms of temporal uh, earthly power and sort of uh, the church's power. Uh, needless to say, as the Reformation was unfolding, the 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 mixture of uh, kingly earthly power and the power of the Pope and um, you know who who has authority over what. Um, that's one of the issues that came up right away. And, you know, the Reformation never would have survived if not for the political protection of German princes. Um, but also, you know, the reformers were um, making clear, clearer distinctions. For example, to say bishops, they have the power of the keys of forgiveness. They do not have the power to de depose kings, um, that there are two realms and these aren't to be mingled or confused. Um, and, um, you know, and that's a hard one, uh, because, um, you can go, you can go all the way the other direction and say the church should never say anything political, which is, uh, difficult. Um, uh, it, but it's, it's the uh, opposite end of the spectrum from the church is entirely political and, and taking the reins of, of power and making things happen the way they want it to happen. Um, a great Martin Luther King sermon is called Paul's letter to American Christians. And he basically is sort of reimagining re the letter of Philippians um, to his, to his time. So I just want to read a little bit from uh, Martin Luther King's uh, sermon. He says, American Christians, I must say to you, as I said to the Roman Christians years ago. So he's speaking as if he was Paul. Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or as I said to the Philippian Christians, ye are a colony of heaven, uh, which is citizenship in heaven, which we just uh, read. This means that although you live in the colony of time, your ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. You have a dual citizenry. You live both in time and eternity, both in heaven and earth. Therefore, your ultimate allegiance is not to the government, to the state, to nation, nor to any man-made institution. The Christian owes his ultimate allegiance to God. And if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is your Christian duty to stay, take a stand against it. And then he goes on in, in kind of like manner. I think that's a good recent example of um, uh, someone taking Paul's words and making a good distinction, but also then using that distinction to say what the church ought to be saying in the midst of public life. But to say dual citizenship can create a issue where um, where is your highest loyalty? Yeah. And if my citizenship is heaven, I shed the earthly citizenship. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't cling to it. Well, that's the struggle. What does it mean to be dual citizens, or is that not the right way to way to think of it? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> not not so long ago, I was having a conversation with someone that I really admire, and it really took me back because we were talking about the the horrendous things we have done as a as a human race to the environment and to the place we live, this planet that we live on. And this person who is a Christian said, well, I don't worry about that stuff because God's just gonna take care of it anyway. And I said, well, it seems to me that God gave us a planet that was perfect in every way and re, uh, creates itself along the way as God, as God directs. And uh, perhaps instead of your answer to that, God's answer will be, I'm not gonna come back until you fix it, you know? <laughs> and uh, because, you know, when you, when you have citizenship in heaven, you have to take responsibility for the place you live as well and for the people that live in it. Uh, you can't just shove it off. Our, our whole our whole being our whole life is given to us with as Christians especially we know that we're stewards yeah of, of 
all that we're given. That concept of stewardship, it's more than financial. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't mean with my comment that we disregard the environment or the place where we live or the people we live among. And then we, it means that we take the higher calling into the place where I am yes. at the time. Yeah. Okay. And that's difficult for people who aren't Christians. To, I remember when we took girls in at our house in, in China, well, even all the people we've taken in here too. One of the first things we tell them is, you cannot do anything that will make me love you less. And always remember that. And it seemed like a lot of them wanted to test that. <laughs> but um, that's difficult to understand uh, on this planet, when you live on this planet and try to survive. Yeah. Pastor Barth uh, used to say that uh, uh, as dual citizens, we have one hand on the plow and the other hand on a suitcase. And I always thought that was good. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Because my background is. Um, evangelical, Baptist, those lines, we always responded to everything with a scripture or scriptures. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was scripture. It was our base all the time, always, always. And it might interest you to know, Judy, when you said that, I went, oh yeah, that would be Revelation eleven eighteen, where God <laughs> says, to destroy those who destroy the earth. You know, I mean, and that immediately comes to my mind when I go, yeah, we might be citizens somewhere, but, you know, we can still be called destroyers of the earth, you know, and mm -hmm. if we're participating in that, whether we love God or whether we're God's, the cross's enemy or not, we're still participating in the destruction. And so, anyway, so I really hear you. <laughs> hmm. um, Gerhard Ferdy has a great short book called Where God Meets Man. Luther's down to earth approach to the gospel. And it's so good on, on talking about how earthly, how earthy Lutheran theology is and, and that whether it's vocation and calling, but uh, one of the, one of his uh, quick, quick ones is when we are really persuaded that God's kingdom comes by grace, then and only then do we come down off the ladder and put our feet on the ground, the soil of this earth once more. And then he actually goes on to say something uh, about the devil and, um, and to me, it reminds me of C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. But basically he says, if the devil can get us to be so religious that we leave the world, he can have it all to himself. Oh boy, that could be a big ouch. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know. And, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Right, yeah. I've heard that statement many times. True. I think it's a contrast to the early part of this reading today, where Paul is in tears. Uh, I mean, that's a, such a different response. That is, <laughs> it's not looking down on someone. Mm -hmm. It's looking across, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a position of grace. It's, yeah, well, we're going to talk about this on Sunday in the class on grace. Um, we're going to talk about the free will or the unfree will and how uh, if your theology, um, if, you have a, if you have a theology of a free will, that produces judgment. And if you have a theology of the unfree or the bound will, it produces compassion. And uh, we'll talk about some of that on Sunday, but, but, but Paul is, is evidencing someone who's moved to tears because he sees people just following their appetites, the God of the belly, um, and, 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 and the whole, the whole way down saying, you know, uh, I'm being true to myself. I'm following who I am and, you know, and, and I'm being authentic. And he's just saying, don't you see? <laughs> um, so. I have a little bit of a contrast there. Yeah. Because I know a number 
when we see God is their belly, we seem to think pleasure and pursuit that direction. And I've seen those whose belly contained deep, deep suffering. Yep. And out of the suffering comes the rejection or whatever we want to call that, the disbelief, the, mm -hmm. the, the veil yeah. um, also. So I, and that's what my mind goes to when I read Paul's words of crying for those, not out of their stubbornness, but out of their pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then isn't that what it's all about anyway? I mean, people go after things that are unhealthy because of their pain, even if they don't recognize their pain. Well, loss of a child, those kind of things are yeah. not something you've pursued. There's right. something that come to you. Right, right. So from, from heaven, our Lord comes to save. Um, we have transformed. He will transform the body of our humiliation to be conformed to the body of his glory. Um, so again, we have, we have the, the resurrection of the body, which should um, cut off any notion that, again, we are to escape um, creaturely existence. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if the body is not raised, then God has not defeated death. He's simply translated it. Um, into some other definition. Just one quick second. Hey, Emmett, could you turn your volume down real quick? I've got my preschooler just came home and he's making, he's distracting me. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Andrew started a part-time job this week. And so we're trying to re rejuggle children. So, all right. Um, let's see. Anything else on this section? Um, all right, let's let's push into chapter four. Uh, he loves and longs for his his brothers and sisters. He calls the church his joy and crown, calls them to stand firm, and then, um, you know, a, a, after he's after he's said all this, now he's going to urge a real specific thing. Um, he's he says in verse two. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So this is interesting. It's just a quick little, I mean, this, this section is kind of a quick little aside, and yet it's deeply connected. Uh, you know, he's already talked about having the mind of Christ and having, you know, everyone's interests uh, and not our own. Um, he, he's already talked about not um, uh, complaining, uh, but to shine like stars, uh, you know, and now he's uh, getting even more direct and naming people whose dissension is causing um, trouble in the congregation, or at least it will. Uh, maybe Paul knows, you know, what anybody who does laundry knows, which is if you let the laundry pile up, it becomes more daunting. And then, you know, um, finally, you have to have a laundry day, which means it's going to take all day to catch up on laundry um, if you don't stay on top of it. And so he, he sees something going on with, with these two women, these two uh, co-workers, these co-strugglers with him in the gospel, um, that they, they need to uh, come to peace. Um, I think it's important that he uh, calls them uh, uh, strugglers beside him in the work of the gospel, um, he sees them as, as peers in, in at least this sense. Um, he uh, calls them co-workers uh, along with Clement and, uh, and then some others. And then he talks about this loyal companion in verse three, which um, it's not altogether clear who the loyal companion is. There are uh, a few suggestions. Um, uh, one could be uh, just describing sort of the Philippian church as if it was one person. Like when I say, good morning, Bethesda, that would be like Paul saying, uh, I ask you also my loyal companion, like just the whole Philippian church, all of you, I'm asking you to help these women. Uh, mm. it, it could also be Epaphroditus, his, uh, his friend that was ill and who's going to be sent by Paul back to the Philippians so they could have joy and see that he's all well. It could be that Epaphroditus is going to carry this letter. And so this is actually Paul um, uh, speaking to his message bearer 
to say, hey, you, uh, you, my loyal companion, help them. Um, so that could be that as well. Um, in any case, you can see a larger point, which is that um, uh, to have the mind of Christ, to be united, uh, all these things, this is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing uh, charge and challenge in the church. Um, the, there's, there's great impact to division, and it doesn't take much. It doesn't take uh, you know, a big church fight over worship or human sexuality. It can, just, uh, it can begin with two people. Um, and, uh, and, and go from there. And I know, I know we all know this. <laughs> How do we do the laundry uh, as a church and not let it pile up? You were referring to a singular person other than the, the women? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so verse three, yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women for they have struggled beside me. So that loyal companion, whoever that is. And in yeah, fact, my, yeah, my translation includes and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. That's in there too. That's further in verse three. Oh, okay. So re, uh, could you read from the beginning of verse three out loud? Re read what I have? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. And I ask you, loyal yoke fellow. Help no, that's it women who have contended at my side in the name of the gospel and then it goes on with along with clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names yeah. are in the book of life yeah that's right so i'm trying to identify who is this loyal yoke fellow oh, okay yeah okay. um <clears throat> and, and uh, yoke fellow is, a, is i mean it's a strong it's even a stronger term than co-worker i mean a co-worker mm -hmm. you are each doing the same work uh but a, a yoke fellow is we are we're oxen <laughs> under a yoke. Uh, my translation says partner. Yeah, I mean that can work too. Um, uh, mine says companion. There's partner. There's there's a few. In fact, the 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 word is actually also can be a proper name. Um, Sizagos would be the Greek name uh, of just a person whose name means companion. Oh, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> There are some translations out there that say, yes, and I ask you also, my loyal Sysagos, to help these women. Hmm. So it could be that it could be a person's name as well. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but most, you know, most of us would rather try to figure out who this person is than to do the laundry of reconciliation. <laughs> Especially with joy. Right. Yeah, with joy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know let's let's uh, make this next one our last section for today, um, because he uh, he kind of has a, a conflict resolution sandwich he's building here. He begins by saying, "I love you. I long for you. My joy, my crown. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge these two women and everybody to help them to make peace and rejoice in the Lord always. I say, rejoice. Be gentle. The Lord is near." So he. He's a good manager or, or leader or something, uh, or I should just say he's just a good pastor, but um, he's, he's trying to make sure conflict resolution is not because he likes to um, make life hard, um, but he, he uh, is reminding us of who we are and, uh, and couching everything in, the, in, in what God has done for us so that we can actually be of the same mind in the Lord. I can't help thinking that as a leader in the in the uh, the Jewish, uh, if I could say Jewish church, the you know the the whole synagogue thing, and he was all of that and everything he recited. That he didn't sit down in his cell some nights and say, "Oy vey, hmm. I got the same thing here." Yeah, Christians are just like the Jews. No. What have I started? <laughs> no. uh, he mentions the that the all of these named people. Their names are in the Book of Life. I just I think that's interesting because uh, Book of Life comes up several times in the Book of Revelation. Um, so it, and it and it has echoes from the Old Testament, um, Exodus, Psalms, Daniel, Malachi. Um, uh, it, it's you know especially as he's talking about citizenship in heaven. Um, it's it's. 
it's again a, a, a promise, a gospel promise that uh, your name has been written down. It's in a book. Um, even though you're struggling in the gospel, even though, um, you know, uh, um, being a person whose life is shaped by the cross um, uh, isn't so glorious, uh, your name is written in the book of life. So you don't have to worry about all that. There's a whole new, different discussion about that. If you examine what the word name might mean, it's more than just Mary. It, mm -hmm. so there, there, a whole bunch more that could be looked at as what does it mean to have your name? Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, it's something we don't we don't pick up on as much in modern in the modern world. Uh, your name is sort of your your reputation but um in some you know in some cultures to have somebody's name is to sort of have a power over them so when moses says you know when they ask me who sent me who shall i say sent me and he gives them the divine name yeah and, and that's in that is an essence and so yeah. to write an essence is impossible <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, yeah. The, the divine, the divine name is a whole, you know, yeah, yeah. education in itself. Yeah, that's. But but to to be but to be given a name. I mean, Jacob wrestles the angel of the Lord or something by the river Jabbok, and then he says, "Give me your name. I won't let you go till you give me your name," um, because a name is 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 a, a, is it's a power, but it's also it's 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 an access, and when you have someone's name, you know how to get a hold of them. This is why. Um, I, I get nervous when um, liturgies get further and further away from the names God has actually given us to call upon him. Mm. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's very common to s sort of say, well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is, you know, there's at least two boys and maybe a girl and Father, we all have daddy issues and, you know, the Son, we don't want our Savior to be a man, you know, we got to kind of de-emphasize that and so then you end up getting like all kinds of nicknames or metaphors for God. And some people even baptize people in these other kinds of names, um, which is not what we were given. And it doesn't mean, you know, you have to say uh, God is a male father only or something. But um, when you've been given a name, God is saying, here's my name, call upon me and I will answer you. This is my name. And that's a big thing. Um, if you, I read a lot of fantasy and a little bit of sci-fi, but a lot of fantasy, and probably a few of you have read Ursula Le Guin over the years, her, her Wizard of Earthsea uh, books, and the whole magic system in that is based on knowing somebody's true name, and if you know their true name, you now, you now, you've got them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Mary, your name is not just Mary in the Book of Life, but there's there's something else there. It's like you hear your well, name. And some of our, well, get a white stone with our name written on it. I've right. investigated that. I know my name. You don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a secret that God knows, and maybe he's told me. <laughs> you know. Well, and, and yeah, and um, sometimes, you know, our name actually means something. Like, what does the name Thomas mean? What does the name Mary mean? And so then we can sort of take that on as, an, as a thing. Um, what, isn't it beautiful to consider that when God calls us by name, as we see him face to face, it's a lot more than, Hey, mm -hmm. Tom. Yeah. It is. Hey. And then some, I don't know, something <laughs> that just perfectly names who I, who I maybe never thought I was or <laughs> who God made me to be. And I never quite uh, understood it. <laughs> I don't know, but I'll know it when I hear it. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, you know it when you hear it. That means we must have gotten close enough to recognize. Yeah. Or we are finally given the, the new ears to, to hear. Yeah. Hear, yeah. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's probably the most common scripture I put in greeting cards to people <laughs> that I send. Uh, the peace of God or, or, or the guarding of your heart. Um, 
it's a beautiful passage. We might, we might want to um, pick it up more next week just to, to let it breathe more. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, it's incredible. I mean, there's at least, um, you know, at least a few things come into, come into perspective. If, uh, if our celebration, if our rejoicing in the Lord is, uh, is gentle, uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to find a prayer that can overcome anxiety or, a, or a prayer that finds peace in the midst of anxiety that's ongoing. Uh, we're going to find patterns of thought that surpass understanding, but, but also celebrate God's goodness, um, throughout creation. Um, and we're going to find a, a way of life that embodies the gospel, which, um, he goes on, we didn't read verse nine, but that kind of embodies that. Um, I mean, and, and look at how, look at the foundation for the rejoicing, the gentleness, the not worrying, the praying, uh, the foundation is the Lord is near. And we've already talked today about, you know, heaven is near, heaven, is, it's here and to come, uh, the kingdom is here and to come, the Lord is near and to come, but the nearness of the Lord is the basis for a gentle, prayerful uh, rejoicing posture. And um, I mean, that's, you lose that on the street corner uh, with the sandwich board preacher, the Lord is near. Uh, and, and you have to be anything but gentle to, to, to preach the gospel on the street corner. Um, uh, the Lord's nearness is actually a reason to breathe and, um, and proceed with, with uh, careful compassion. Um, it doesn't mean um, to be a doormat and it doesn't mean to be inactive, but it's, ac it's actually to be made known to like, let Christians be known. Uh, but, but let Christians be known for being gentle uh, in the midst of the Lord's nearness. We can afford to be gentle when living in the expectation of the Lord's coming. I also like the idea that our the, the, the guardian of our heart is peace. Uh, uh, that uh, you know our 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 guardian angel, so to speak, um, uh, the peace in our mind is that's what protects us. It's it's not um, our measure of readiness or our zeal um, or what we think now we've 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 got in us but it's, it's God's peace that protects us. Okay, comments on that or closing thoughts? And you read from Purity. That book has been on my shelf. It's falling apart since 1972. Oh yeah. <laughs> Even before you were born. <laughs> oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, there's a there's a piece in here that I, that I just love. It says, in other words, when man lives by faith and trust in God, when he takes care of his kingdom as he is supposed to, he is at peace. And mm. this in this very peace, he images God. Just as God rules over, loves, and cares for his kingdom, so man is to have love for the kingdom. In that way, he lives in the image of God at peace with his maker, with himself, and with his world. He lives down to earth. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that the peace we have and the faith we have in God gives us a readiness to take care of what he has created. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, I don't know, Tom, I'm just obsessed with you becoming a father again, I guess, but <laughs> I keep thinking, uh, well, I'm so many other things going on, but um, I keep remembering how when those babies would be crying and fussing and, and, there were, and it was the quality of the mother or whoever was holding them would become theirs. I mean, it's that, that gentle rocking, that peace within the one who's holding it. <laughs> mm -hmm gets transferred to the one in distress. And I just see that here so much. That's what I feel some mornings in my prayer chair over there. And I can just feel God holding and rocking. And so maybe that's the guarding of the peace, but it's his peace that becomes 
my piece. Not really, but it, it's so experienced, like mm -hmm. that infant must feel that piece of the father or the mother. Anyway, that's, that's why I go, like, I'm just going to give up all these prayers and relax into this. And it's not easy to do. It comes with kind of colic sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Good description. <laughs> yeah. Or all the colicky babies. <laughs> I, you had one of those. <laughs> we had one of those. As you've been talking, Tom, what I wrote was when we live rejoicing in God, we live in the peace of the Lord, his gentleness, which brings peace in our hearts and gentleness in our living, our actions. Yeah. Amen. Okay, it, it's it, we're on the hour here, so we got a break for the day. We'll pick it up next time, either either Sunday as we talk grace or next week. Um, uh, we might still need two more weeks for Philippians. Um, we might. <laughs> I don't want to rush, um, but I, I will. I will, would take suggestions for uh, what to work on. Uh, after that, if we want to stay in the New Testament or go back to the old or do a topical study or do something for Lent that's uh, more topical than, than a book of the Bible. So think about that. My evangel article is already due, so I got to think about it quickly. So <laughs> <laughs> question is Sunday's class um, online? Yes, Sunday. it's a different link. Could, to, could you give give us the link or yeah well you can like you what you can do now is just bookmark there's one web page that's going to have everything you need every week um, oh. yeah bethesda dot updates dot church thank you and if you go if you go there you'll see a whole bunch of uh, of links or buttons you can click on and everything from the bulletin for Sunday to the live stream for Sunday. And then down near the bottom, you'll see events and you can just click on the right event. Okay, events. Yeah, which right now, oh, that's the Ash Wednesday one. Okay, right now our Ash Wednesday bulletin is live. So I don't see, oh wait, event for Sunday at Lent. Is that my class? No, that's not. All right, well, if you don't find the link, um, like uh call me like sunday morning and be like eh, i can't find it because it's out there not a good time to call you <laughs> yeah hey, i i have a list right in front of me i'll give it okay, to you Judy, thank you i eight just thir eight thirteen eight one three eight one three zero eight oh zero eight zero six eight nine seven four six eight nine seven four would you repeat that please Eight one three zero eight zero six eight nine seven four. Thanks, Judy. Mm -hmm. Got it. There you go. All right. Have a good we Thursday. On Sunday. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.